Hello and welcome once again to What's Out There, the paranormal podcast from Out There Paranormal and chatting for you tonight on this top secret episode. We have myself, Nigel. And myself, Juliet. You told me off, didn't you? Yeah. Well, no, actually. No, I didn't <laughs> tell you off. Okay, I, I made some comments because you've worked jolly hard on writing this podcast up. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it might be a little bit intense and in-depth because you've got all the knowledge of the military history and it's your specialist area and stuff that you love. And I was just a little bit worried that people might get lost generally because I got lost. And I know it's not difficult for me to get lost because I can get lost in a paper bag, let's be honest. (laughs) But that that was it. That was just my only worry. I went a bit highbrow. You did? I I know. (laughs) Highbrow, big brow, <laughs> monobrow. There are lots of military terms in this podcast this evening, and I may have got a little bit overexcited, as I do when I get onto military subjects, like Jules said. Basically, we're talking about psychic soldiers. Now, you have to watch out for us psychic people. We can be quite dangerous. After it, after researching this, yes, you bloody well can. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be really rather wary of you in the no, future right. because look out. some of the stuff, researching this, some of the weird and wonderful stuff that I found out is like, oh my God, can they really do that? Oh, can yeah. they really do this? We can zap you. Um, Easy. I'm really quite scared about yeah, this don't now. Don't upset me. Because one of the stories later on when we get to towards the end of the podcast is going to make you think, I really hope she can't do that because oh, yeah. uh, I know. You probably could, can't, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> I like people to think we can. Exactly, you shouldn't have said anything, should we? I know. You should have kept that quiet. Shh. Had them all scared. Secret. Watch Shh. out. We've got a secret weapon. I know. It's Jules. <laughs> it's not much of a secret Set weapon, is it? It's yeah. a bit tragic, actually, isn't it? <laughs> oh, bless you. Well, I don't know, though. <laughs> if, you can, if you can weaponize it. Yeah, right. And point it towards your enemy and fire away. Yeah, Putin, look out. Exactly. Wouldn't that be good? That'd be really cool. Cool, yeah. Come on, Jules. You can do it. You reckon? If you concentrate hard enough. Okay. I'm thinking. Thinking. I'm thinking Putin. I'm oh, thinking. God, I don't want to think about Putin. No, that's not good, is oh. it? You got those visions again, didn't you? Good Lord. Honestly, this is one hell of a rabbit hole for us to fall down. Um, basically, I had a good look around... Did a lot of research, but I just can't do this topic full justice in one episode. We whether we go back to it later on, I don't know. But what I have done is um touched around the edges There's a lot some to of cover. the topics, and there is a lot to cover. So all we're gonna do basically is sort of give you a feel for the world of the psychic soldiers and psychotronic warfare and uh yeah, scary stuff. It is very scary stuff. Some of it is completely mental. Some of it is completely amazing, and some of it is just, what the fuck? Exactly. Okay, so. Okay, so where are we going to go first, Nigel? We're going to go and see our old friend, Mr. Putin. He's not my friend. Is he your friend? No, he's not my friend. No, he's not my friend either. They were our friends once. Not anymore. Before the Cold War. I'm not getting political, but I don't like him very much. We don't like the Soviets or the Russians, but once upon a time they were called the Soviet Union. They were. And they liked to dabble. Yes, they psychic do. psychic experiments. It's fascinating, isn't it? It is really, really fascinating. But just considering the put-downs that our psychics get out there in the community, and we do get a lot of flack, it's quite interesting to hear that there was quite a lot of experiments done. Yeah, and really sort of highbrow stuff as well, and really intense experiments. And there were some of it, mm. when we get further on, as you'll see, some of it actually has got proof that it actually did work. And that's the scary bit of it, yeah. Talking Mm. as somebody that has, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, psychic abilities, you know, I don't don't like using that term, but I often wonder where it comes from. And, I mean, there's got to be a scientific explanation as to what happens and why it happens and how it happens. Yeah. There's got to be. We just haven't found it yet. Not yet, but... I mean, I am honest as the day is long, um, 100% in what I do. And it would be really nice if we had some kind of scientific validation to prove that there is some truth in it. Yeah, I mean, we've got a a 
got proof. Um, I've seen proof myself of some of the things that you've said to me that later on I found out when I've researched, gone back and thought, well, how did you find this? How did you yeah. know that? And in amongst the bits and pieces that you've given, you can mm. sort of, you can piece the story together and find out that you've actually managed to find, you know, small pieces of information that actually fit into what we're experiencing at the time. So it's really, really interesting. What I find really fascinating though is when I tune in and <clears throat> I work at, you know, a particular site or whatever it is that Nigel takes me to, the information I get, I get a lot of pictures in my mind and it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle and trying to connect all the pieces to make them make sense. And what I don't understand is why it's always fragmented. It always comes through like little bits. You never get the entire picture. No. And I think that is why people are dubious about it because they're like, yeah, right. Well, you know, if you were really a psychic, a true psychic, you would have all the names, all the dates of birth, all the locations, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't get it. I makes me wonder whether or not do. it maybe it's just small pieces of people's memory that are left behind. Maybe. Small pieces of information that are just recorded in that place. Possibly. And it's yeah. like playing a tape recording for instance where the microphone's not working yeah. and you'll get a little bit of music and then it'll stop and make crackling noise and get nothing and then you'll get another little bit and then it'll stop and you'll get nothing and then you'll get another little bit but as the, as the tune plays along you can sort of listen to it and hear exactly what the tune is but you don't get enough of it to actually hear the whole song you just get small bits does that make yeah, sense no it, it does it's just I just find it sometimes a little bit frustrating you know because I'd, I'd love to be able to get all the information and say right a b c d and e you know but yeah you, it, i just don't but it does really wear you out when you do it mm. and I've, I've brought you home for investigations when you was just flat out tired but you've had a really sort of heavy night Ugh, and i'm always tired i know but i mean really really you're like you know, so I'm a single mum with two kids yeah i'm always flipping tired i was picking <laughs> up jules just saying sometimes when you come back though you are really really bothered. yeah it does drain you yeah. actually yeah. i think it's because <clears throat> when you tune in and you concentrate and you want to make sure as hard as you can and as, as much as you can that the information that you're giving is correct and it makes sense because sometimes things come in different order. It's not always clear. It's jumbled up, you know, and a lot of the time people will say to me, you know, I've had people look at me and go, that, that's not right. It doesn't make any sense. But then what you have to do is kind of look at the information, almost write it down and see if there's any connection and how it can make sense and make it all fit together, like yeah. bits of it. And not, not saying that we actually force the bits together and make no it way. fit the narrative. No, we you don't. Can't. You can't. Because some bits you can think, well, okay, I'm not sure entirely certain how that fit bit fits in, but that, that bit that there that makes sense. Because yeah. you, you've said to me before, <clears throat> who've been out on investigations, well, I'm not sure that that makes sense to me. Hmm. Um, but then quite often you will go away and do a bit more research and then something will come back to you and you'll say, well, actually, this happened. So, yes, that does make sense. But it's just so fragmented. And quite often people will say to me, you've got the information wrong. It's not right. But it's just trying to make it as clear as I possibly can coming from me. And it's not the information I'm getting that's wrong it's quite often the way I interpret it that's wrong, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah. yeah you've seen the part of the vision, but the vision's so quick, you can't actually get all the information. So, so you I just don't get small always, yeah, I yeah. don't always interpret what I sense, what I see, what I feel as absolutely right. And that's my fault and that's my error. It's not to say the information that's coming through to me is wrong. No. You it's know, just but your I just do my best. I do my best. And when I was training, my God, this is many years ago. Um, when I was I was learning and training, um, there was another psychic that had a lot more experience and he was mentoring me. I was always worried about saying what I felt and saying what I saw. And he said to me, just tell it as you see it, tell yeah. it as you feel it and be completely honest about everything. Because if you do that, nine times out of 10 is right. Yeah. If you start trying to make it fit, make it make sense and stuff like that. That's when you run into problems. You said, don't do that. Say what you feel, say what you sense, say what you see and leave it as that. Yeah. 
and let somebody else write it down, make notes or interpret it. Yeah. You know, and advice. that was, do you know what, was the best advice that he ever yeah, gave me. That's really sound advice. Yeah. The reason why we've sort of gone off on this sort of tangent is basically what Jules is talking about is the kind of research they were looking into. They were looking into telepathy, remote viewing, that kind of stuff where people are concentrating on an image, trying to find something, looking at it, and then explain it to the person. What are those cards that you can... Zener cards. Thank you. They're the ones. I yeah. can never remember the Zen name. cards, yeah. Yeah. They use them in Ghostbusters, They do they? indeed. Oh, yeah. brilliant. With the, with the electric shock. That's oh, right. you got that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I've got a set of Zener cards. <gasps> can I have a go? I'll put you so I can, I can make up an electric shock machine as well. No, no. No. Just, no. <laughs> thank you. Just the Zener cards. Yes, please. Then. Okay, yeah, we can do Zener cards. And if I get rewarded, can I have a sweetie? Yes. Thank you. You can. Or okay. a glass of wine. Oh, do you know what? I'd... Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Oh, do you know what? Red. Red? Yes, please. Yeah, big glass of red. 19 crimes. No problem at all. Yes, please. Thank you very get much. Cup, Thank get you, a couple of bottles in. We might do well on that. Well, a couple <laughs> of bottles. Perfect. <laughs> could be an interesting session. Yes, it could. <laughs> Where were we? Soviets. Yes. Let's get back to where we were, psychic okay. soldiers. Okay. And the Soviets. Soviet research on telepathy dates from the early 1920s, when at various institutes, experiments were conducted focused mainly around the field of telepathic communication. The Soviets, it seems, appear to have been fascinated with telepathy, which they called biological radio communication. And their experiments included some rather out of the ordinary stuff. First out of the box, we have Vladimir Durov, a famous animal trainer. Durov became known for his ability to communicate with trained animals by mental suggestion. Working with another Soviet scientist, here we go, Bernard Bernadovich Kaczynski. Oh, so you usually, you usually do that to me. <laughs> I know, you've got, me you got your own bag of head, you? Yeah, right. you, can, you can read that bit. Yeah, yeah thank you. Durov's home became a centre for research on animal psychology. Now, to use his mind to give a command to a dog, Durov would start by looking deeply into the dog's eyes. He would direct all his mental powers towards imaging the exact task the dog was to perform, as if he were looking through the dog's own eyes. After implanting the idea in the dog's brain, Durov would give the order to act it out. Now, as you can imagine, this process was not always successful. Overall, Kaczynski reports 696 of their experiments with mental suggestions to dogs were successful, 582 were not. According to a zoological statistician at Moscow State University, analysis of the results showed that the dog's responses were not accidental, but produced under the influence of the experimenters. Telepathy apparently worked with dogs. At least. See, and that's not even people. I know. See? Huh? See? 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 Yeah. See? So now, of course, telepathic communication with dogs was not the main goal of the Soviet Institutes. Oh no. Oh no. They also experimented with human subjects, and some of the experiments they performed are rather interesting indeed. So here's a little taster of the fun and games that the Soviet Union were having by messing about with people's minds. Hey, in one experiment, a girl, dosed with the psychedelic drug mescaline, attempted to see into sealed boxes, whose contents were neither known to her nor to the person conducting the experiment. In ten such tests, she achieved two complete and five partial successes. A seven out of ten. Yeah, it's not too bad, That's is it? That's pretty impressive, yeah. Mm. So it was claimed that USSR researchers successfully taped the central nervous system signals of a man who was playing piano. Now later, they were able to broadcast those messages back into the arms of a different person who had never played piano before. That person would then be enabled to play difficult music but also would retain some of this skill as permanent learning. 
it's my turn for a hang on. So they're saying they can tape someone's nervous system and recall the waves that are in it and then play that into someone else and then they can actually then play a piano the same as the other piano, even though they yeah, can't play a piano. I, <laughs> yeah, like, I'm not convinced on that one. Bit of a leap, bit of a leap there. But there yeah. we go. The Soviets have already experimented with the use of flashing lights for the purpose of eliciting behavioural changes in human targets and have used these lights on a number of occasions. There have been persistent reports of unusual flashing lights emanating from Soviet naval vessels and long-range aircraft. Such activities have coincided with the US and NATO surveillance operations conducted from interceptor aircraft and naval vessels. In some cases, personnel have been temporarily blinded and disorientated by various intensities of colours or continuous or intermittently flashing lights during nocturnal missions. I'm not surprised. You yeah. would be blinded, won't you, if somebody's flashing lights in your but face? I think what they were doing is, I think by, by flashing them in a certain sort of pattern in a certain way, they could actually sort of confuse do, do, the people do, do, on the other do, do, side. Do. You got it, you see. Yeah. Right. That's the way they talk. Mm hmm. Fears of Soviet psychic abilities, and in particular, telepathic hypnosis, which allegedly allowed the USSR to telepathically induce sleep in individuals and then rouse them from over a thousand miles away. K.O. Kotkov, allegedly a star Soviet psychologist, was particularly intimidating to US authorities given his apparent ability to telepathically obliterate an experimental subject's Consciousness, -ness, -ness, ness remember? Consciousness, -ness. I'm glad you I gave you that one. This podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. You can have that one. You yeah, know, I'm not sure about this. So, 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 yeah. Wait a minute. So somebody's sleepy and they can wake them up from another country. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm. And they can also put them to sleep as well. Not convinced. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. I mean, come on, really? Possibly. I don't know. Hmm. Now, the Soviets were also taken with the possibility of psychokinesis, using mental imagery to move objects, and one well-known exponent of this art was one Ninel Kulagina. Now, Kulagina heard a radio report about a woman who could see colours with her fingers and declared, I can do that, recalling that while convalescing in hospital, that's Izzy the ghost cat in the background. Having <laughs> a scratch. While convalescing in hospital, she had been able to pick the coloured threads she needed for her embroidery from an opaque bag without looking at them. Now, to convince her disbelieving husband, she demonstrated this ability while blindfolded. In repeated experiments, she showed that as well as correctly identifying hidden colours, she could read text, discern the dates on coins, and accurately reproduce simple drawings made by him in a separate room. See, that's good. Yeah. That I like. That's really interesting, yeah. And these experiments came to light some weeks later when the couple told a doctor about them. Two decades of investigation on her additional aptitude for psychokinesis followed, mostly conducted by Russian scientists, but also intermittently by five Western scientists who became aware of Kulagina through a 1968 documentary film. Hmm. Now, typically, Kulagina sat at a small table and was observed to move small objects placed in front of her without touching them. Apparently, by a process of mental concentration. Now, the objects included items such as matchsticks, an empty box of matches, a cigarette, an empty metal salt shaker, and a wristwatch. And the usual starting distance between her and the objects was about half a meter, but success from up to two meters away were reported. She was also observed to spin a compass needle 360 degrees in either direction, stop a pendulum or change the direction of its swing, move a hydrometer floating in water within a wire cage, prevent a scale from unbalancing when extra weight was placed on one of its pans. Kulagina was reported to have stopped the beating of a disembodied frog's heart and to have revived a fish that were near dead including one that was floating upside down and another lying motionlessly on the aquarium floor. 
They swam for several minutes. Hang on a minute. <laughs> right, okay. I know a little bit about fish. Okay. Okay. As a kitty, I used to have fish in mm -hmm. a fish tank. Okay. And, yep. you know, it didn't do too badly. Swim bladder. Have you heard of swim bladder in fish? Yeah. Where they swim upside down and they act like they're dead? Yeah. If you give a fish crushed peas, now a fish man in Great Yarmouth told me this. He used to run aquariums, ladies and gents. This is intriguing stuff. Right, okay. We, we, you are, we are going off at a tangent here. It's quite important. A swim bladder can make a fish look like it's dead, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you give a fish crushed peas, it can help with swim bladder and turn the fish the right way up and can make it better again, okay? So it could be that this fish floating upside down and, and lying motionlessly probably wasn't dead. Mm -hmm. Probably has something like swim bladder. And all she had to do was slip it a pee <laughs> with no one looking. Slip it a surreptitious pee. Well, yeah, right. And then all of a sudden, okay, the fish is, do you know what I mean? Mm, not sure about You're that. You're not sure about You don't like that one, do you? No. I, you know, well, peas. It, it's right you saying, questioning these things. However, this all seemed too good to be true, and accusations were made that Kula Gina manipulated objects by means of magnets concealed. And peas. And peas, yeah. By means of magnets concealed in a clothing or vagina. Really? <laughs> Have you ever hidden a magnet up your vagina? Or a pea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or by definitely using disguised threads. But none of these have been substantiated, however. Okay. Now, the Soviets were more inclined than American scientists to believe that paranormal phenomena might be the result of bioenergetics or the energy given off by the metabolic process of living things. This theory stated that people exuded bioplasma. I love that sound. It's a nice word, isn't it? Well, I love the sound, I love the word. A theoretical energy field that, under certain conditions, was capable of emitting charged, coherent radiation beyond the body's surface in the form of electrons and possibly protons. Although the Soviets did not reach consensus on the existence of bioplasma, the very pursuit of this theory indicates that Soviet parapsychologists were attempting to explain alleged paranormal phenomena with a greater degree of <laughs> Why did I type this word, George? Specificity. Specificity <laughs> than their Western counterparts. <laughs> Honestly, there's always one that I can say. Can't this how many takes me to I don't that. know. I just sometimes I get a word that I cannot say. Oh God! In what was it? We consciousness. Heard? Consciousness. Consciousness. Oh, that and was a funny one. This one is I, I still can't even say it, George. Specificity. Specificity. It took me a few goes. I've got it. <laughs> Anyway, basically means they were looking at it in a great more, more detail. greater detail than That's the Americans. Right. So this section here has really interests me because they're talking about sort of bioplasma and energy fields and things, which is something that I've always been interested in within the paranormal because we have the ability to produce these sort of energy mm -hmm. fields and we've detected energy fields for want of a better purpose when we've been out investigating using yeah. our the little trifle meter we have naturally occurring um, electromagnetic fields rather than ones that are produced by ac current or electrical equipment so i think the soviets were on the sort of right course of action with this i think you're right you've actually said to me before that sometimes when we've been investigating you wondered whether it was me emitting something that was affecting the kit yeah. rather than something paranormal happening. And that was one of your queries with me, wasn't it? We're going to have to do that with that... What, experiment? With the tri-field, yeah. Yeah. We'll actually rig it up so it's sort of pointing at you and then... Yeah, see, see if, what happens. If the, the only people start picking stuff up, will it start going off? That'd yeah. be interesting to see that. Yeah. Let's do it. There we go. Okay. Anyway, back to where we were. We got a bit excited there. Yeah, right. So there we go. There are the Soviets messing about with all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. And then what we're going to do, we're going to go over across the pond. We are indeed. And over to the Americans. The United States of America, people. Our friends. Yeah, yeah. What are you saying, oh, yeah, for? Yeah, they're our friends. They are our friends. Sometimes. Oh, they are. Oh, they are our friends. I know. Yeah. Well, anyway, just when you think that the Soviet psychic experiments were batshit crazy. Along comes the United States of America saying, hold my coat, 
You ain't seen nothing yet. If there's going to be any batshit crazy, it's going to be the United States. It's got it? to be the Americans. Sorry to American listeners, by the way. We're quite happily calling you batshit crazy, but let's be honest, you do do some weird stuff. And some amazing stuff. They do indeed. Okay, so let's delve into it. Okay. Okay, so where do we begin? I know, I know. Let's start with some simple mind-altering drugs. Yes, please. Yeah. Now, in fact, there is a crossover here as both the USA and the Soviet Union were experimenting in this field. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the wonderful world of psychedelic warfare in the guise of MK Ultra. Okay, MK Ultra is a blanket term for over 100 different CIA led programs during the project's duration. In reality, the true nature of these programs is difficult to understand. This is because the CIA destroyed most of the evidence in 1973, leaving a shroud of mystery about the program. So, why did they destroy it? This is the thing. Yeah. Um, there's two popular opinions about why they destroyed it. The first one is because they didn't think it worked and they just wanted to get rid of it because it wasn't, you know, worthwhile keeping it. The second one is, as you read through it, you'll realise, is because they were undertaking some pretty dubious bloody they things. They absolutely were. With handing these drugs out to people. Good Lord. So, yeah, if you sort of carry on, okay. we'll see where we get to. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a trip to the 1950s and the 60s, excuse the pun. No. Yep. The height of the Cold War. The United States government feared that Soviet, Chinese and North Korean agents were using mind control to brainwash US prisoners of war in Korea. And in response, Alan Dulles, director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, approved Project MK Ultra in 1953. Now, this covert operation aimed to develop techniques that could be used against Soviet bloc enemies to control human behaviour with drugs and other psychological manipulators. MKUltra is like a piece of software designed to hack the brain. Through the programme, the CIA scanned the human mind in search of vulnerabilities and psychedelic drugs were the primary key. So, eat your heart out, Elon Musk. They were there first, these guys. The intent of the project was to study the use of biological and chemical materials in altering human behaviour, according to official testimony of CIA Director Stansfield Turner in 1977. Now, the project was conducted in extreme... Sh- Now, Turner said, because of ethical and legal questions surrounding the program and the negative public response that the CIA anticipated if MKUltra should actually become public. It's a big old cover up. Huh. Oh, yes. One of many. Now, under MKUltra, the CIA gave itself the authority, gave itself the authority to research how drugs could promote the intoxicating effects of alcohol, render the induction of hypnosis easier, enhance the ability of individuals to withstand privation, torture and coercion, produce amnesia, shock and confusion, and much more. Many of these questions were investigated using unwitting test subjects like drug-addicted prisoners, marginalised sex workers and terminal cancer patients, people who could not fight back, in the words of Sidney Gottlieb, the chemist who introduced LSD to the CIA. Gottlieb is a complete nutter. That's shocking. It is shocking. I mean, that's they're actually experimenting on people who can't. Oh, my God, though, but terminal cancer patients? I mean, it's, it's yeah. Oh horrendous, isn't it? God. Okay, so... The CIA began to experiment with LSD, and this was under the direction of agency chemist and poison expert Sidney Gottlieb. 
Now, he believed the agency could harness the drug's mind-altering properties for brainwashing or psychological torture. Under the auspices of Project MK Ultra, the CIA began to fund studies at Columbia University, Stanford University and other colleges on the effects of the drugs. After a series of tests, the drug was deemed too unpredictable to use in counterintelligence. I'm not surprised. It's not surprising really, is it? Let's be honest, mate. <laughs> Drop a tab of LSD and then try and get exactly. something sensible out of the person who's tripping their bollocks <laughs> off. LSD was not the only drug used in MK Ultra experiments. Here's a great list for you. MDMA, which you might know as E or ecstasy, opiates, methamphetamines, and even magic mushrooms are notable mentions. In addition, scientists performed experiments with hypnosis and behavioral modification techniques. Okay, now, no one knows the results of the project, as many of MK Ultra's records were destroyed in a 1973 purge, and many had been destroyed throughout the program as a matter of course probably because they didn't want anyone they to know what they were doing what up to, yeah. and the only documents that remained were 8,000 pages of records mostly financial based which did not throw much light on the clandestine operation It's disgraceful. It's shocking. It really is disgraceful. When it came to light in um, 77, what they'd been up to, um, there was a Senate inquiry about it. I'm not surprised. And it was really, really awful, the stuff that they were doing. Like I was saying, the, the subjects that they used. That's horrific. Uh, it's, it's almost going back to Nazi warfare. Uh, yeah, it? it's really, really awful. Um, one side project, however, of MK Ultra was something called Operation Midnight Climax. I'll bet it was, especially at midnight. From Chikawawa. Operation Midnight Climax was an MK Ultra project in which government employed prostitutes lured unsuspecting men to CIA safe houses where drug experiments took place. That's a bit seedy, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit, yeah. Good Lord. While intelligence agencies had often used female agents to seduce targets, the CIA wanted to study how sex, especially in combination with drugs, could loosen men's tongues. Oh, I'm not surprised it did. <laughs> yeah. I get it was guess it was very successful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going there. The project would involve setting up a CIA finance bordello in an apartment in the Telegraph Hill section of San Francisco and a similar government-run brothel in New York City's Greenwich Village. In San Francisco, the CIA paid prostitutes $100 for each potential subject they picked up at local bars and lured back to the bordello. That's not a lot of money, is it? I suppose you're talking about 19... 50, 60, so I suppose yeah, it probably maybe. was then, yeah. Okay, so the CIA dosed the men with LSD and then, while at times drinking cocktails behind a two way mirror, watched the drug's effects on the men's behaviour. Recording devices were installed in the prostitutes' rooms, disguised as electrical outlets. The programme had little oversight and the CIA agents involved admitted that a free-wheeling, party-like atmosphere prevailed. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> brilliant. Prostitutes, like, LSD way. and cocktails. We're wrapping a wild yeah, time here, boys. That's the job that you want, isn't it? <laughs> what? No. What are you saying now? <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Higgins. I wasn't saying you, just in person. I'm just saying. Yeah, great. You, as in uh, like a lot of yous. Oh, flipping hit you, you around the head with a wet kipper in a minute. <laughs> now, with the destruction of the MK Ultra documents and recordings, we will sadly never know what insights Midnight Climax was able to provide. <laughs> Indeed. Ultimately, the use of LSD for mind control has poor results. Scientists determine the substance is ineffective as a mind control tool. The unpredictability of the drug on subjects being the main reason for this. The drug induced change of the subject's mental state pollutes the collection process. As a result, 
Intelligence gathered from LSD dose subjects is questionable at best. Have you been taking something? Not this evening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did have a glass of fizz. Oh, God. But there is a story, however, that at one point a drug was developed. Mm. And this became known by the abbreviation BZ or BZ, believed to be an anticholinergic deliriant, meaning it's related to stuff like antihistamines or more closely to the chemicals in Datura, Nightshade, etc. It was developed for use in warfare. One small dose can incapacitate a person for days, during which they'll be unable to function normally. And not only is it a delirium, but it can also cause hallucinations. And the hallucinations from anticholinergic drugs are usually quite realistic and often terrifying. The 1990s film Jacob's Ladder is said to be based on this drug and rumours abound that it was given to American soldiers in Vietnam as it was in the film, with similar results. It's a nasty one. That's really a nasty cool. One. Have you seen that film? That Jacob's cool. Ladder is yeah. an absolutely brilliant That's film. Really cool. I mean, movie. it's still if boys and girls, if you have boys and girls, boys and girls. Where did I get that? Oh, it's a good show. Boys and girls. Boys and girls. Jacob's Ladder. Who stole the sausages? <laughs> it was Jacob. Naughty crocodile. <laughs> Okay, so after we got rid of the naughty crocodile, Honestly. we can go back <laughs> to, to discussing MK Ultra, And this, of course, falls under the umbrella of psychotronic warfare. Psychotronic warfare, ladies and gentlemen. It's like something out of, like, the Terminator. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Transformers movies or something. It's brilliant. I'm loving this. It's cool, isn't it's it? It's just so weird. Yeah, right. Where were we? The phrase psychotronic warfare is frequently found in theories and alternative ideologies. It refers to the notion that some people or organisations are employing cutting edge technologies such as the use of radar, electromagnetic radiation and surveillance methods to remotely target and control the feelings, ideas and bodily experiences of particular people. Frequently for evil intentions to cause bodily harm, implant sound and ideas into people's minds, make someone hear words in their heads and use them as psychotronic weapons that have the potential to injure, kill and do all the actions as the controller wants. Mm, now, there is no doubt that during the Cold War, the Soviets and the US and other countries were conducting human experiments using many kinds of drugs and electromagnetic radiation to find ways to control the human mind and make it work as they want. But there is not enough evidence to prove whether they fully succeeded or not. And let's be honest, even if they had have done, they're not going to tell they're us. Not going to they? say they're not going to reveal they're not it, are they? Release it, so you can imagine they? somewhere in a file locked away, there's going to be the information that says actually this shit works and there's, we're still using it. There's so much locked away files. Say, yeah, some of the stuff they do. I mean, this is all we're talking about: 1960s, 1950s, 1970s. Oh yeah, they're still doing this stuff. Of course they are. They're Good just, Lord, they're just not talking. about And many it. more things. Look, yeah. I, I've mentioned Musk before, but if Musk can do implants into human brains successfully. Yeah. What the hell are the government up to? Say, that would just, be my question. Yeah, it's a worry, isn't it? Mm-hmm. There were elements of psychotronic warfare experiments that did make it into use by the military, however, one of which was the use of music and subliminal messages, which includes the use of the children's song, I Love You, from Barney and Friends, on Iraqi prisoners of war, and the alleged use of music and subliminal messages at the 1993 Waco siege and other FBI operations. So what they do, basically, they play these things on an endless loop into the prison cells. They were doing it as, I think it's the Al Gharab prison in Baghdad, and they also mm. did it in Guantanamo Bay as well. Um, I think Guantanamo, they used ACDC, um, all yes. sorts. Um, yes. They'd, they'd play the music at that. full volume, non-stop. They'd yeah. leave the lights on, just sort of really do the people's heads in. So I have to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what tune would drive you insane or torture you into revealing your secret information? Mm, I'm sure there's quite a list. There's going to be quite a list. And in fact, if you want to tell us, you can always email us.
In fact, email us because we'd love to know. And what's our email address? It's outtheregroup at icloud.com. So, yeah, go on. Email us and tell us the song that will get the information out of you. Okay, so time to climb down from our drug-induced high. Turn off the microwaves and turn the music down because we need to focus our minds, clear our thoughts and take a look into the Stargate Project Files. Stargate was a codename for a secret US Army unit established in 1978 at Fort Meade, Maryland by the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, and SRI International, a Californian contractor, to investigate the potential for psychic phenomena in military and domestic intelligence applications. The project and its precursors and sister projects went by various code names, Gondola Wish, Grill Flame, Centerlane, Sunstreak, Scanate, until 1991 when they were consolidated and rechristened as the Stargate Project. Now this project focused on remote viewing and that involves someone known as a remote viewer seeing an object, person or place from a great distance with one's mind or via an out of body experience. Now this unique project involved the use of army personnel who were in effect trained to demonstrate clairvoyance on demand, mentally travelling all over the world in search of terrorists, kidnap victims, hostages, crashed military aircraft, secret Soviet bases and much more besides. Top secret psychic experiments have been going on for decades in the USA. In 1952, Dr. J.B. Ryan conducted the Army's ESP tests. In the 1970s, the CIA and NSA worked with the researchers to test psychic abilities, hoping to create a perfect spy who could wander the world in their mind without leaving the room. That sounds so cool. It, it does, yeah, yeah. Now, many evolutions occurred throughout the project, and in addition to some speed bumps along the way, some professionals who were assisting with CIA psychic programs were found to be frauds, including a certain, dare I say it, Go on. Yuri Geller, Mr. Spoonbender himself. Now, a BBC documentary, The Secret Life of Yuri Geller, suggests. CIA and Mossad spies tapped his paranormal skills for decades, including during a mission to release a hundred hostages trapped in Uganda's Entebbe airport in 1976. Now, Geller's psychic skills were also tested for eight days in 1973 as part of the CIA's Stargate program, but you've guessed it, there were questions asked about his abilities. As Project Stargate evolved, so did the technique involved in remote viewing. CIA psychic spies would have differing levels of success for each method. There are three categories that Stargate controlled remote viewing would focus on. Coordinate remote viewing, CRV, was a method that asked viewers what they would see at a specific coordinate. Extended remote viewing, ERV, was a method that combined a relaxation and meditation. Written remote viewing, WRV, combined channeling and automatic writing. This technique was widely regarded as much less reliable and was a source of controversy ever since its inception in 1988. Now an example of the Stargate project proving to be successful is with its most renowned remote viewer, Joseph McMoneagle. Now, Mook Monegal was formerly in the army as a warrant officer before being selected to become a psychic participant in 1978. Now, over time, Mook Monegal established himself as the best psychic in the Stargate program and, of course, the entire world. He not only was the headline for the Stargate program, but also the clearest evidence of psychic phenomena to the CIA. Under the National Security Council, McMoneagle 
used remote viewing to identify the undisclosed Soviet base and accurately described Russia's new nuclear submarine, the Typhoon, in 1981. Another example of Muk Monegal's abilities is when he helped identify the location of kidnapped American General James Dozier with no information. But in the end, controversies would see Project Stargate come to an end in 1995. Many projects failed or had loopholes that were later debunked. The reliability of many techniques and operatives was questionable at best. Even Mock Monegal, the top remote viewer, had many claims that he could not back up with additional source information. See, that's another odd one, isn't it? Because they're saying, oh, it didn't work. Mm. But then they're saying, well, it did work because exactly. you've got instances there where he's actually got information correct. Exactly. And when I was doing the research for this, there were other sections as well where they said that they, they found things that were sort of very yeah. close to what they'd actually discovered later on down the line. So there's there's definitely something in it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. It's, I mean, it's really weird. There's too many people, too many people with psychic abilities um to rule it out completely yes yeah. there's definitely something going on what is going on we don't know yet no and how it happens and why it happens we don't know yet but there's definitely something it's really really interesting i mean just sort of when i was researching this and going through and looking out for stuff i mean it's just the it's the sheer volume of things that i oh, found yeah. it's just like wow Huge. i just never realized how much of this there and was a lot of it got destroyed as well yeah you know yeah so we will never actually know Exactly what happened. And a lot of it is still classified. But there's still, I mean, you know, I've heard that the FBI still use psychics up to this day to help solve murder crimes and they stuff. Do. Yeah. They're still doing the rounds. There's yeah. still stuff going on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We need to be taken seriously, guys, our psychics. We're not all jokers and clowns. Exactly. There's unfortunately there, like in every field, there's certain elements that give you a bad name. Exactly. Unfortunately, but it's sort of clearing out the dross and looking at the sort of the genuinely gifted people, and there are genuinely gifted people out there. So, pack up your kit bags, ladies and gentlemen, because you are about to join the 1st Earth Battalion and become a new age super soldier. We even have our own manual to help you along the way. Our manual is a 125 page mixture of drawings, graphs, maps, polemical essays, and I don't know what they are, and point-by-point -point redesigns of every aspect of military life. We have designed a new battlefield uniform that includes pouches for ginseng regulators, divining tools, we have foodstuffs to enhance your night vision and a loudspeaker that automatically emits indigenous music and words of peace to help you on your mission. That sounds like my kind of kit. That's a, it's the unit you want to join, isn't it's it? It's damn fine. That's it. First Earth Battalion. Yeah. The First Earth Battalion was the name proposed by Lieutenant Colonel Jim Channon, a US soldier who had served in Vietnam, for his idea of a new military of super soldiers to be organized along New Age lines. According to a book by journalist John Ronson, Shannon spent time in the 1970s with many of the people in California credited with starting the Human Potential Movement and subsequently wrote an operations manual for the 1st Earth Battalion. Now, Channon believed the army could be the principal moral and ethical basis on which politics could harmonise in the name of the Earth. Now, he declared that the 1st Earth Battalion's primary allegiance was to the planet Earth. Channon envisioned that the 1st Earth Battalion would organize itself informally, uniforms without uniformity, structure without status, and unity powered by diversity, and members of course would be multicultural, with each race contributing to rainbow power. 
He also proposed as a guiding principle that members of the 1st Earth Battalion seek non-destructive methods of conflict resolution because their first loyalty is to the planet. So, warrior monks of the 1st Earth Battalion, are you ready to swear to uphold a credo of high commandos and guerrilla gurus? Repeat after me! I have the capacity and therefore the duty to contribute to the development of myself, my associates and our planet simultaneously now. I will organise a self-supporting high commando group that will create and perform evolutionary breakthrough actions on behalf of the people and planet. One people, one planet. I will then pass on this concept to others who are capable of generating further self-organising commando teams. I will await the time when my group can connect naturally with others at higher and higher levels of awareness and performance. The Natural Guard. Phooey! I have a sneaking suspicion that Lieutenant Colonel Channon just might have dropped a few tabs of LSD from the MK Ultra stash. This is the result of the trip he took. Far out, man. In the last story, you mentioned a book by journalist John Ronson. This book is well worth a read, as it covers many of the stories you have mentioned here. The title of this book is The Men That Stare at Goats. Uh, the book was turned into a TV series in 2004 by Channel 4 entitled Crazy Rulers of the World. And as you might have guessed, as usual, we have saved the weirdest story until the end of our episode. Hell yeah, that's what we always do, we right? We always do, yeah, there's always a good one right at the end. Okay, so whilst researching for his book, Ronson interviewed a number of former and current US military personnel. And in doing so he stumbled across this totally mental tale. Shoot, Nige. Say hello to Albert Stubblebean. A uh, what, what? Albert Stubblebean. Okay. <laughs> it's a name and a half, isn't it? Isn't it? Retired Army Major General, a career military intelligence officer, a proponent of psychic warfare, levitation. Really? Spoon bending. Uh-huh. Walking through walls mm-hmm. and staring at goats. Staring at goats. Until they died. Oh, wow. Yes, you did hear that correctly. Okay. Animals! General Albert Stubblebine III said, while explaining his psychic training plans to US Special Forces commanders in 1983. Stopping the hearts of animals. Bursting the hearts of animals. The general's outburst was met with stony silence. Stubblebine feared he'd gone too far. A year later, he retired early, convinced his bleating had come to nothing. What the general didn't know was that America's Green Berets were deadly serious about testing his goat idea. Just a few hundred yards down the road from where the Special Forces brass gathered that day, the US was housing 100 De-bleated goats. De-bleated goats? De-bleated goats. How do you de-bleat a goat? I have no idea. What? I don't think I want to know. Okay. Animals, apparently, who couldn't, could open and close their mouths without emitting a sound. The top secret goats... <laughs> Goodness <laughs> sake. Honestly, you can't make this up, can you? The top secret goats, forever sworn to silence, were used by the Green Berets in battle training exercises. If Americans could somehow learn to stare goats into the ground, they might be able to do the same with enemy forces. Okay, so green berets, silent goats, and American soldiers staring at the silent goats. You've got it. Right. Okay, okay. It will become apparent as we go through the story. Don't Uh worry. Okay. There is purpose and meaning to this. (laughs) So it seems... General Stubblebine 
commanded a secret military psychic spying unit from 1981 to 1984. Basically, six soldiers in a condemned building in Fort Meade, a black op that didn't officially exist. By the mid-1980s, however, Special Forces had undertaken a secret initiative to create super soldiers. Officers with superpowers who could walk into a room and be instantly aware of every detail. Special Forces didn't stop there, however. There were levels beyond superpowers, including heightened intuition and invisibility, although merely remaining unseen was acceptable. And of course, there were the GOAT experiments. At least one intelligence officer had stopped a goat's heart in a deadly stare-off at the military secret goat lab. Oh, come off it. Military secret goat lab. You Are got you it. serious? Yeah, I'm serious. What the heck? Okay, so what is this mysterious goat lab? Well, the goat lab was part of the Special Warfare Center and school at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where Green Berets shot goats in the leg and learned how to treat wounds, deal with trauma cases, and address other types of battlefield injuries. Poor goats. I know, it's horrible, isn't it? It's harsh. Shoot the goat, band him up, he's all right. Ah. Now the progression to goat staring was inspired by someone we met earlier. Oh yes, it's the hippie trippy Lieutenant Colonel Jim Channon. Him again. He's back. Author of the First Earth Battalion Field Manual, who liked to encourage aspiring super soldiers to embrace their psychic powers and, of course, be in touch with their inner self. We have to ask, of course, who was the vaunted goat slayer? The soldier able to drop a goat with a steely stare. Over to John Ronson to spill the beans. I discovered that the main goat starer was a man called Guy Savelli. And I said, is it true that you managed to kill a goat by staring at it? And he said, yes. And I said, do you still practice the technique? And he said, as a matter of fact, only last week, I killed my hamster just by staring at it. Really? <laughs> so, okay. So he's staring at goats and killing them. But, oh, but that isn't enough. Let's pick on the bloody hamster. Well, he has to keep, you know. Really? Yeah. Really? All uh, right. Don't worry. So he played me a tape of him staring at his hamsters, apparently, for three days. What? He was just staring at a hamster for three days? Yeah. Three days full stop, <laughs> solidly. Yep. No sleep, no eating. Just three days staring at a hamster. Yep. Really? He's a super soldier. Really? You have to remember that. They don't just die straight away. And sure enough, about halfway through the tape, one suddenly just dropped to the floor. And I said, oh, you've done it. And he said, yeah. He probably died of starvation. <laughs> you know, we don't know how old the hamster was. <laughs> no, actually. It could be a geriatric hamster. He'd starve to death for days. He's okay. Because then, you know, just before the tape ended, the hamster gets up, brushes itself down and carries on eating. Oh, for goodness sake. And there was me getting all excited, <laughs> thinking he was murdering elderly pension hamsters. He's killed the hamster. No, he hasn't. Oh, dear. Good Lord. So while Savelli also claimed he killed a goat during a government-controlled experiment... He admitted the wrong goat had died. Number 17 instead of number 16. Now, because he was having trouble, apparently, concentrating. Savelli couldn't verify that claim either, however. A videotape Savelli offered to Ronson as proof involved a different experiment where no animals died. So there was no hamsters and no goats then? No. Okay. We only got this word... This story doing the rounds that there's one person that managed to stare a goat and kill it, stare at a goat long enough for it to die. I mean, why would you? Yeah. Well, the... I mean, okay, I get experiments were taking place. I get, okay, I, I can just about fathom a goat thing, but a hamster thing? <laughs> a hamster thing? Really? It was just Savelli, you know, keeping his eye in. 
practicing. Okay. <laughs> All right. I love this story. This is so stupid. Right? But I mean, imagine if they were well, no. It's real. I know that. Excuse me, this is not made up. It's not invention. It's actually true. Oh, my God. Completely true. Oh, God. I mean, Ronson said, I believe all the historical stuff about them trying out this stuff. I've seen enough documentation to know they really were trying to kill goats by staring at them. And those experiments happened. What I don't believe is that any of them worked. Why did they pick goats? I suppose they had the goats there already. Couldn't it have been a sheep? Well, I suppose, but they already had the de-bleated goats that they were shooting for their battle yeah, training. Sort why of... goats? I don't know. You know? It's... It could have been anything. We just spoke the, the goats were conveniently there, which is why they used them. Why do they de-bleat them? It's just odd. Well, so when you go out merrily shooting goats all the time... Merrily you... shooting goats? Well, how often do you go out merrily shooting goats? You make it sound like, <laughs> oh, well, I'm just going out to merrily shoot a goat. Really? <laughs> Well, a lot of time, Nigel. I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, I have never shot a goat. Merrily. <laughs> Merrily. <laughs> or any other way. <laughs> I am say. not a goat shooter, nor a goat slayer, and have not stared a hamster to death either. I was going to ask you about the hamsters. No, I, I was about to say, well, I, what about the hamsters? I've then? had a hamster that died, but oh, I've never God. stared him to death. Oh, they oh. do eventually, don't they? Oh, everything does eventually. Exactly. Well, you weren't staring at it, right? No. Okay, fair no, enough. I woke up in a more nary was. Oh. Stiff as a board. <gasps> Are you sure he wasn't hibernating? No, he was on his ladder. Are you sure he wasn't hibernating? And if he was so sort of, no, he was definitely bigger mortis a setting because he was like entwined in the ladder. I used to have a hamster. Did you? Yeah, and I had a gerbil called Bup. Here we go, boys and girls. I know. Pet tails. Yeah. Off on a tangent. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm presuming the goats were used because they were there. They already had them for the... Experiment oh, the, little things. the things I do in shooting them and dressing the wounds and stuff. And I think the reason why they got these specially de-bleated ghosts, they didn't make a noise when they were being shot. It's why horrible. Did, why did they have to shoot them and then do that? Why can't they just use pretend models or something? Because they want the reality of the God blood. And, sake. I don't know. Poor little things. I'm not an American Special Forces Green Beret. I have no idea why they want to do these things. Flippin' heck. Yeah. It's horrible, isn't it? It's Americans, they like shooting things. Now. I'm sorry. Shooting goats and killing hamsters by staring at them. But he didn't. Thankfully. The hamster didn't die. Oh, I know. He got up and finished his dinner. Poor little thing. After three days of staring. Dear me. There we go. Throughout this episode, we have delved into the batshit crazy world of psychic warfare, as you may have gathered listening <laughs> to some of these stories. However, we've only tiptoed around the edges and we positively encourage all of our listeners to take their own trip into this fascinating world. You really should do it because it is honestly. But avoid hamsters and goats. Yeah, okay? no, no goat shooting, no goat staring, no, no hamster staring. No. Okay, you can make yourself your own first Earth Field Battalion manual, complete with ginseng pockets in your uniform. No and, LSD, people. No, don't drop LSD. That's not wise. <laughs> and I really wouldn't encourage you know prostitutes around your house so you can film them through a two-way mirror. Don't look so excited, Nigel. Well, I suppose she's mates with LSD and drinking cocktails. You should see Nigel's face right here. It's like, oh, yeah. I wouldn't encourage that. I quite like that idea. No, I don't. <laughs> Stop it. I've lost myself now. But anyway, like I was saying, have a look into it, sir, because we have only sort of tiptoed around the edges. We haven't sort of dived. It's fascinating. Right in. It is absolutely mad. And to help you along the way, we've, we've stuck a load of links in uh, the episode description on the website. So go and have a look at the links and click on them and have a look because there are some really mental stories. I've also included a link that will enable you to watch the 2004 TV series um, that we mentioned, uh, World's Gone Crazy or something, that um, was based on the John Ronson book. Is psychic warfare now just history? Well, even to this day, you can still find headlines like this cropping up. A Russian defence ministry report claims its elite soldiers can crash computers with their minds and read documents inside a safe after mastering telepathy from dolphins. You really can't make this stuff up. Well. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, just... what is there to say? Where do you start? <laughs> I mean, you couldn't possibly take that to pieces, can you, and analyse it? Not it's really, no. completely mad. But um, I actually really enjoyed researching it. Mm. 
because it was so interesting. Uh, because I mean, I, I fell down quite a few rabbit holes. I mean, I the problem on the back of this is you find ideas for other podcasts and a few goat holes as well. I think <laughs> keep away from the goats. <laughs> but when I, I was researching this, I started looking at um, Nazi teams that are researching into like German myths and all this kind oh, of stuff. Like, the the Nazi World War one Two. I mean, whole, I just, that's uh, a whole other podcast. That yeah, really, I don't want to fall down that rabbit hole. You know, stay away from that one. But um, yeah. It's a different episode. Um, it's not our usual fan no or UFOs or ghosts or cryptids, but it's all part and parcel of the paranormal. Oh, really? Yeah. And I'm sure. I think it's good that we got to share these stories because then you got to sort of talk a little bit about how you work as well. And I think it's quite important that people understand that the, the things that you I do, don't the even things understand that you say, how I work. <laughs> well, to give a, give people an idea yeah. of, of what yeah. happens, you know, because um, sure, it's difficult to put it into words. But then I think you did a really good job at I the beginning of the really podcast. Hard, yeah, yeah, but it's it's hard for me to kind of explain it. It it just happens. It doesn't happen all the time. No, and I think if anyone is looking to expand on their abilities, it's always very good to learn control and to learn how to have the ability to start it and stop it to yeah. switch it on and switch it off that was one of the first techniques that I learned and it's really very important yeah. in this field because you don't want to be tuned in all the time because it's exhausting quite yeah. frankly and you end up incredibly tired so you know if, if you're looking to expand your abilities or anything like that please 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 First thing to tra- to tr- teach yourself, sorry, to train yourself. If you want to tune in, learn how to tune out. That's really important. Yeah, yeah. Because you get stuck in that loop and can't get out. And well, so that, that's that's, thing, that's the it? thing. That's the thing, and it's it's not healthy. No, no, really. not at all. It yeah. really isn't healthy, and you've got to have control over it as well. Yeah. And you know, have you know a normal life. I'm not going to say my life is normal <laughs> because it isn't. But you know, as normal as possible. You know, have have your family life normal life whatever and and tune in when you need to tune in and remember to tune out when it's time to tune out yeah so another episode in the bag yeah but i know we've got something really exciting going up we're planning another episode another out and about there episode we're gonna do we're gonna try and do a recording of us being out somewhere aren't we investigating investigating somewhere so when we trip over or fall you'll hear it yeah when we get scared you can hear hear it it. you'll know we're good at that (laughs) we're very good at getting scared our last adventure um if you go down to the woods for those of you who listen to it that was brilliant if you haven't go listen to that episode because it's exactly what we're going to do again we're going to record ourselves out on an investigation yeah but this time we've decided to give all our lovely listeners the chance to decide where we're going to go. Where we're going to go. Oh, God. We're going to run a poll on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, on Insta and on Facebook, on all our social media feeds, giving a choice of locations. And what we want you to do is to pick which one we go to. Oh, God help us. I know. Please be kind. Yes. We've done this before. <laughs> Um, we actually went out and filmed an investigation. We ended up at a ruined church, which is uh, Divot yeah, Shaw. We did. Um, we offered it on our Facebook group and said, where would you like to send us? And they sent us to this ruined church, That's which right. ended up being an interesting evening. <laughs> yeah, right. And if you want to see the video of that one, that's actually on our YouTube channel too. So, mm. yeah. So we're going to be mic'd up. Yeah. And we're going to go to a place of your choosing. You decide. Yeah, and we're going to run run an investigation there. But the other thing I thought might be good fun while we're at it... Uh Uh-oh. ...is... Oh, no, what? Why don't you not only choose where we're going to go... Right. ...but give us some experiments to do while we're there. Oh, come off it! You've just said that because it's me they're going to be experimenting on. Of course it is! Oh, goodness. so cruel! We didn't discuss this before, huh? I know. I love to throw a little. I'll throw a curveball in, Jules. Oh, I'm good at this. Lord, I should. Lord. I actually just thought of it, but well, how can? But if we're experimenting, <clears throat> they can't see anything. They're only going to hear us. It's going to have to be something we can do that's audible rather okay. than visual. Okay. And how do you envisage that to happen? 
What you can do no, if you have any thought about this, I ladies have. and gents. Yeah, I saw the look on your face. If you have any bright ideas for the things we can do, <laughs> pass it on to the listeners. That's it. So you haven't really thought about have. this, have you? No, it's just an idea that popped into my head just like that. Yeah. Email us with your ideas. We gave you our email earlier on. Here's our email again. It's out there group at iCloud.com. Not only that, if you want to send us anything at all via email, because we'd love to hear your comments anyway. And if we get some lovely comments, then we'll read them out on the podcast too. Oh, yeah, do yeah, that. Exactly. Any stories that you want to share with us as That's well. That's right. We'd love to hear them. Or, you know, if you want to be interviewed by us, if you have any stories that you want to tell us, then we can put that in a podcast as well. Yeah. We're always, always open to ideas. Exactly. So, yes, we love to engage, so get in touch. There we go. As again, our email is outtheregroup at icloud.com. And, yes, we do promise that we will read all the emails. I will answer all the emails and any really, really spicy ones. We'll read out on the podcast. Spicy ones? Well, you know. Spicy ones? Is that what you're hoping to get out of this Possibly, knowledge? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anything interesting, yeah, we'd love to read do. it. So please get in touch. That is it from us. Yeah, we're done. We are indeed. We're going to foxtrot Oscar again. We are. Leave you in peace. We're going to go off and maybe drop some LSD and watch prostitutes. Well, the two maybe you are. Cocktails. I'm off to give your ears a rest. Thank you very much once again for listening to us. And if you'd like to sort of give us a follow, um, oh. I forgot what I was going to say, Jules. Oh, no. What's the usual thing? I know we go through all this spill, don't they? Follow us on social media. We're yeah. at Twitter. We're at Insta. We're at Facebook. And oh. if you want to go to our podcast, give us a review. That's what I was looking for. And the website is? www.outtheregroup.net. Cool. And give us a review. Click on the thing that's got like five stars and tell us how wonderful we are. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. So that's it from me and Jules. So it's a uh, good night from me. And it's good night from me. Good night. Take care. Bye. Bye.